Hello and welcome to Tales from the Doghouse Separation Anxiety Explained. I'm your host, Ness Jones, and with me today is... I am Stacy Bell from Focus Fun in the U.S. Today we have a really, really special guest that I am super excited about, um, Dr. Christina Spaulding. She is a certified applied animal behaviorist. My favorite thing about Dr. Spaulding is that um, she is so sciencey, but she she really gets into the research and presents it in a way that's it really interesting. Because sometimes you read those papers and they're they're kind of boring, but Dr. Spaulding makes it super interesting and accessible, um, easy to understand. So um, that's my she's a hero in my eyes oh. um, for <laughs> for completing that task. Um, she also wrote this book called um, The Stress Factor in Dogs, Unlocking Resiliency and Enhancing Well-Being. It is an awesome, awesome book if anybody is um, interested in digging in in that. So there's my plug for that. We have more plugs later on for Dr. Spaulding. Um, welcome to the show, Dr. Spaulding. We're so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for having me and for that wonderful introduction. Mm-hmm. Um, is there, um, why don't you just tell us about us, a little bit about your background, um, whatever you feel comfortable sharing. Sure. I started off, um, I actually decided I wanted to work with dogs when I was quite young, probably like eighth grade or something like that. Um, and believe it or not, I decided even before that, that I wanted to get a PhD because that's how much oh, of wow. a peak I was. <laughs> Embrace it, girl. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I went to college for, I, I ended up ultimately majoring in wildlife ecology, which was basically the closest I could get to animal behavior at my school. I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which is actually a really big ag school, and there's lots of biology there, but they didn't have animal behavior. So wildlife ecology was as close as I could get. I was also very interested in wildlife. Really, at that point, I wanted to study wolves, which I think is the story of so many of us who ended up training dogs. So while I was in school, I actually, I had a conversation with a TA of mine, and he asked me what I wanted to do when I graduated. And I said, well, what I really want to do is train and rehabilitate aggressive dogs, but I know I can't make any money doing that. So I want to do this other thing, whatever, study wolves or become a ranger or whatever it was at the time. And he said, well, actually, there's a professor here at UW-Madison that is a dog behaviorist. And that was Patricia McConnell. Woo. So, Yeah. So she was an adjunct instructor there. So she only taught one or two classes and I contacted her and long story short, we had multiple interactions. I assisted her training classes for a while and she ended up being, you know, a role model and kind of a mentor for me in terms of how do I follow a similar path to what she did. And I, when I graduated, I didn't go to graduate school right away. I trained dogs for maybe 10 or so years, then I ended behavior work too. And then I went back to graduate school and was shocked at how much I didn't know, even though I had been taking oh, wow. seminars and doing all of these things. And so completed my PhD, got certified as an applied animal behaviorist, and then I started seeing clients again but I really, really missed teaching. I hope this isn't too long of a story. You're good. <laughs> so, You're good. Um, so I ended up deciding to go back into teaching because <laughs> I had taught as a graduate student at the university. Uh, but instead of going back into academia, I decided to teach other trainers. And then somewhere okay. in there, um, I wrote this book. And the reason I wrote the book is because I felt like I was seeing a lot of dogs that were coming to me after their people had sort of tried multiple times to get help. And it was clear to me that the people that they had gone to before me really didn't have a strong understanding of what stress was and how it impacted behavior. And that happened to be something that I had done some of my graduate work on. And so uh, I decided to write a book. 
about it and started <laughs> mm-hmm. teaching uh, to other professionals. And that's how I ended up here. Yeah, It sounds yeah. so simple when I say it that way, but it was. Just yeah, passive. I know. You're like, <laughs> yeah, 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, okay. So just to start off, um, can we, you, by we, I mean you. <laughs> I don't know why I said we, um, can you, um, define some terms for us, right? So for our listeners, which is a mix between, um, just pet parents and also, um, dog trainers and, um, but all centering around separation related behaviors. So, um, just putting that out there. So, when you're talking, that's, you know, who the audience is. Um, but can you just do like a definition of terms for us? I know that we'll kind of get in probably to the different types of stress, but when you say stress, um, how are you defining that? So, uh, stress is one of those things in science that actually does have a fairly decent definition. And so stress is a response to some kind of challenge or change that sort of alters the animal's baseline or or causes a disruption to baseline. So there's some kind of trigger that causes that disruption. And then there's a very specific physiological response that occurs. And that includes the release of stress hormones. So in dogs and humans, the primary stress hormone is cortisol. And so that's what stress is, is it has to include, by the current definition, it has to include this release of stress hormones. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And so just for clarification purposes, you know, we work with dogs that have um, separation anxiety. So when we're looking at the difference between stress and fear and anxiety, I think a lot of times those kind of get lumped together in some respects um, because I think a lot of them are activating that HPA access. And so it's easier to to lump them together than to parse them out. So I guess one of my questions is, is it important to, um, to parse those out and think of those as different things um, as far as their impact on the animal goes Um, or is it kind of okay to be a little bit lumpy there? I think I would say it's better to separate them. And I think it depends to some degree on who you're talking to and, you know, what your audience is, but stress. So let's separate stress from fear and anxiety first. As I said, stress is a disruption to status quo and it's very general. So when we talk about emotions like fear, we tend to talk about emotions having a valence, which I refer Mm -hmm. to as the flavor of the emotion. So basically they're they're good or they're bad, they're pleasant or they're unpleasant. So in most cases, fear is negatively valenced, although Mm -hmm. it could be positively valenced, especially when we're looking at people like going on a roller coaster. Roller coaster, right, yeah. But typically, (laughs) it's negatively valenced. And then something like joy would be positively valenced. So stress, if we're thinking of valence as a flavor, stress is flavorless. So stress is simply a reaction to change. It is not in and of itself good or bad. Right. So that's how stress is different. And and it sounds like we're probably going to get into it, but stress can be beneficial. And in fact, stress mm-hmm. is very adaptive. It helps us to cope with change. That is the function of stress. Fear and anxiety then are emotions. And most pe- most researchers distinguish between fear and anxiety by saying fear is a response to something that is actually happening that is an actual current threat to the animal and anxiety has more to do about anticipation of a threat that has not actually happened yet now Mm -hmm. 
you know, when we're talking about animals, it's a little hard to say for sure. Like, are they truly anticipating something? But certainly many, many, many of our animals can show an anxiety response in the absence of a clear, obvious threat. And when I say a threat, I mean, no one is actively hurting them at this moment, right? Mm -hmm. But they may be anxious anyway. They may be hypervigilant and uh, startled easily and all that, despite the fact that no one is actually currently physically threatening them. Right. Right. I think one of the things that makes it so hard for me when I'm thinking about distinguishing fear and anxiety is like, I always wonder, is there something happening that the dog is perceiving that I'm not perceiving, right? Because Mm -hmm. of their better hearing and sense of smell and blah, blah, blah. And so, um, yeah. But yes, I have heard those dis- those definitions. So those are familiar to me. Um, but I, I really appreciate you reiterating them um, for our audience. Now, with fear, um, stress, and anxiety, um, let well, let's first talk about the different kinds of stress um, because sure. then I think my next question will make more sense. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> Not everyone uses these categorizations, but I really like the three categories that Dr. Bruce McEwen developed. And he was a really big name player in the stress research world, very well respected, put out tons and tons of research. And he distinguished between good, tolerable, and toxic stress. So good stress So remember, any kind of stress, there's some kind of challenge or change. So that's going to be the case in all cases. Uh, So good stress is something that creates a challenge or disruption to the status quo, but is not actually distressing. So uh, many other people may know the word you stress that that's also Mm -hmm. used to to indicate the same concept. I prefer Dr. McEwen's conceptualization because there's three, and I think that's important. So we'll get to that in a minute. So good stress could be traveling would be, well, Mm -hmm. that could also be an example of bad stress, but, um, (laughs) but even if you're having a good time, traveling is still stressful because it's a disruption to Mm -hmm. your normal routine especially if you're going eating, you know, you're eating different food, maybe you've got jet lag, you could be at a different elevation. So there's all kinds of reasons that travel can cause good stress. It doesn't mean you're unhappy, but it's still a stressor. And learning, physical activity, all of those things are stressors. Uh, Hopefully it's good stress, but again, it depends on how the animal's responding. Tolerable stress is a disruption to status quo, but it's also distressing. So now the animal is upset or unhappy due to this stressor. In the case of tolerable stress, the animal is able to cope. So they don't like what's happening, but it's not causing sort of this spiraling out of control of really horrible symptoms and experiences. So we stick with people. We could still talk about travel, right? There are situations with travel that are definitely not pleasant, but that doesn't mean that the person has an emotional breakdown or something. Um, Mm -hmm. And with dogs, all kinds of examples, you know, we're focused on separation related behavior here. So some dogs, probably most dogs don't particularly enjoy it when they're Mm -hmm. left home alone. But many of them are able to cope with it with no apparent long-term negative effects. The third category is toxic stress. And that is when something is unpleasant and distressing and the animal cannot cope with it. And so this is where we start to see a lot of behavior problems cropping up or mental health disorders because whatever is happening in that animal's world they aren't able to deal with it. And now we're starting to see issues, right? So separation related mm-hmm. behavior, aggression, uh, 
health issues often as a result of toxic or chronic stress. Um, Chronic stress, which is happening over an extended period of time, is almost always, I mean, I really, I would say 99% (laughs) of the time, I want to say never, but researchers don't like to say never, but it's, um, (laughs) I'm just going to say it's, it's, or I guess always, I, it's always toxic stress. I mean, maybe mm-hmm. you could come up with some exceptions, but basically stress that continues for an extended period of time is almost always really, really bad for behavior, health, and well-being. So is there acute toxic stress and chronic toxic stress, or is it just chronic? No, you can have acute toxic stress too. So that would generally be considered trauma. Uh, right. They're not okay. necessarily yeah. exactly the same because they're sort of defined in different areas, but yeah. I, I would say that they're essentially the same thing. Okay. Uh, I don't okay. know if I'm jumping ahead, but you mentioned cortisol before, and now mm-hmm. we're talking about the different levels of stress. So when we're talking about cortisol being released, does more, you know, if the stress is worse, is there more cortisol? How long does it stay in the system? All that sort of stuff. Yeah, so that's a great question. And it's really complicated. And we don't, it's, I guess what I would say is it's not always the same. So what happens with toxic stress is the stress system, the um, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is what's responsible for that stress response, it basically starts malfunctioning, and it becomes dysregulated. And so you're no longer seeing a normal stress response, but the way that it breaks is not consistent. So sometimes, and this is probably more common and and this makes more sense, I think intuitively, but very often what you will see is increased release of cortisol, which we call like a hyper responsiveness. But sometimes you actually see a blunted cortisol response so that you're not seeing as much cortisol or you have lower levels of cortisol, but that also seems to be really bad. Um, Several studies have associated found that that is associated with PTSD in people. So, but why it's sometimes blunted and sometimes overreactive? Um, I certainly don't understand that. My impression is that it's just not clear yet that this is something that researchers are still trying to figure out is what does that mean exactly? And and why is it sometimes go higher or lower, but it becomes dysregulated and that leads to havoc in the body because even though we call cortisol a stress hormone, it's actually basically involved in, in, regulating every single system in the body. So once cortisol goes haywire, everything else starts to fall apart as well. How long should we expect it to stay in the system or does that depend on how much is released? It depends. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) And so a normal, in a normal healthy animal that's having a normal cortisol release it seems like it tends to peak in about 30 minutes and then start to come back down. But that's not, I'm always hesitant to give that number because everyone, everyone asks this question. That's an average in a healthy animal. So how many of the animals that we are seeing are actually having that 30 minute peak and come back down? I, I mean, I don't know. Um, In terms of how long it lasts in an animal that's dysregulated or experiencing chronic stress, that's really hard to say. That's going to depend on genetics. It's going to depend on how old the animal is. It's going to depend on their previous experience. It's going to depend on their access to coping skills. So that is going to be highly variable for each individual. So when we're looking at the impacts of, um, let's say toxic stress, um, Mm -hmm. on 
the longer term. In, so the shorter term impacts, um, we have this, um, the release of the hormones and, you know, our heart rate goes up, we mm-hmm. lose our appetite. Um, what else? <laughs> I'm trying to think of all the things. <laughs> Respiration <laughs> increases, Respiration. Um, blood glucose increases. It, it basically, the, and I should have probably said this before, but that stress response is preparing the animal to deal with whatever this potential threat is, whether it's, you know, a disease or, you know, being chased for dinner, you know, there's any huge number range of things that it could be, but Fight or flight refers to the stress response system, although there's really more, a much wider range of responses than just fight or flight. Right, right. Okay. So when we're looking at the long-term effects, um, since cortisol affects almost all the systems in your body, Mm -hmm. um, and then that becoming dysregulated sounds like it could have. And I know because I read the book, but, <laughs> but for our listeners, um, this is a spoiler alert. It, it affects, so, like, I, I knew it affected a lot. I knew it affected life expectancy and propensity for some diseases and everything. But when I was reading, it, I was like, wow, it's just everything. I mean, just it's, everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. So can you, I, I know that you're not going to do a reading of the book at the moment, but <laughs> um, can you just talk about like maybe some of the, the top systems that are affected by this, um, you know, and, and maybe how, how that might affect how we interact with our dogs? Sure. So the, um, I think what I'll talk about is the impacts on the brain because that's going to be most directly applicable to behavior. So what toxic stress does is it causes the, one of the things that does is it causes the amygdala to become hyper responsive or hyper active Among other things, the amygdala is responsible. It plays a major role in fear. It also plays an important role in what we would call saliency. So it's, you know, in our environment, there are thousands of inputs, perceptual inputs that are coming in all of the time. And we cannot possibly attend to every single one of those things. So our brain is constantly making these decisions about what we're going to pay attention to. So right now I'm looking at the computer screen. I'm not paying attention to what's going on outside my window um, or all the stuff that's on my messy desk. Um, I'm trying (laughs) to focus on this, right? So at this moment, you guys and the computer screen is what is salient to me. And the amygdala plays a role in determining what is salient and what it needs to pay attention to and what is threatening. So when that becomes hyperactive, it's pinging off the whole bunch of things that now the dog is sort of tuning into uh, and maybe responding to as if it's a threat when really it shouldn't be. So it's just sort of over identifying important, Mm -hmm. possibly threatening stimuli. And then at the same time, the emotional response to that is likely to be stronger because fear comes from the amygdala as well. So that is one impact of stress. It also decreases activity in two other brain areas. So the first one is the prefrontal cortex And the job, one of the jobs, one of the main jobs of the prefrontal cortex is to help regulate behavior and regulate emotion. So now we have this amygdala that's going crazy and haywire. Is this record? Like people can see this video? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. (laughs) I was like, I don't know if I'm just doing this for you or for everyone. So the amygdala is down here going crazy and the um, prefrontal cortex is supposed to come in and settle it back down. 
but it's not working properly. And so it can't do that. Uh, and it just also plays a big role in impulsivity. And so you can see, you know, it, there may be, I don't think this is as well studied, but there may be increased impulsivity under conditions of chronic stress. Now I'm wondering about that. I'm like, I don't know if I've read research on that. So I'll have to go, <laughs> have to go look into that. Um, but definitely there is this emotional regulation component where the animal is not able to regulate their emotions as effectively. And then the third area is the hippocampus. And some people may know that the hippocampus is involved in memory. Um, the hippocampus is also impaired like literally it shrinks in response to toxic stress. And there are lots of memory impairments involved in things like PTSD. The problem is it's really hard to understand how that might apply to dogs. But the yeah. other thing that the hippocampus does that is really, really important is it plays a role in context. So the hippocampus helps the amygdala understand if something is actually threatening or not. So we go back to our horror movie example. If you're watching someone like screaming and being chased and being stabbed, if that was actually happening to you, you would probably be very scared. Well, and you're probably kind of scared, you know, <laughs> on the horror movie too, but your res response to it is going to be very, very different because the hippocampus is going to say, this isn't real. This is a movie. You're okay. Or um, perhaps more relevant to our dogs, if something negative happens in a specific context, I go to the vet and they do this scary thing to me. The hippocampus says that scary thing happened there. So that place is unsafe, but the rest of your world is okay. If the hippocampus becomes damaged, the animal starts to lose that ability to distinguish between safe and unsafe, and they lose those context cues, and then everything becomes unsafe. And so that's how you can get, you know, these dogs that are responding as if everything is threatened. Yes. And yes, I've met those dogs. Yes. <laughs> and if you're on edge all the time, then you're going to respond more strongly to other things that otherwise might be okay. So separation anxiety dogs, I, I don't worry. I should tell people that I don't, I mean, I've done some separation anxiety cases, but once um, the specializations came around, I just started referring out to the specialists for that. But a lot of separation anxiety dogs are under chronic stress, right? Toxic mm -hmm. stress because every day or multiple times a week, they're going through this panic inducing experience that is very stressful and that's happening to them mm -hmm. over and over and over again. And so not all, and I, and I do want to stress that not every dog is going to respond exactly the same way. Some of them are more resilient than others, but I do worry about dogs with separation anxiety that this may start to manifest itself into other areas of their life, including mm -hmm. health, yes. because of the chronic stress that they're experiencing. Mm, yes. It's quite scary, isn't it? So yeah. One, yeah. And you see that, don't you? You see a dog that's got anxiety about this one thing, and then suddenly it's something else and something else and something else. Yeah, it's a horrible chain reaction. Yeah. Yeah. So what can we do about that then? So how do we address this? Oh, that's a big question, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it is a big question. A magic one. Um, I, I think I spent two chapters on it in the book. But so there's a lot of things you can do. So there's five things that seem to increase an animal's ability to cope with stress. Exercise, and I want to stress voluntary exercise. So the research that has been done, I think this is important though, because people it, it put on treadmills. Yeah. Right. Um, the research that has been done has been done on voluntary exercise. So we don't know what happens if you force an animal to exercise. Um, um, so we need more which, research around that then, I suppose. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> around um, everything pretty much. Oh, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's getting so much better. Mm -hmm. um, so exercise, 
control over the stressor. So Mm -hmm. increasing agency Agency. Mm -hmm. and choice, predictability, Mm -hmm. increases an animal's ability to deal with stress, um, enrichment, and social support. So social support is, I mean, it's sort of a vague generic term, but, you know, that's having allies that provide comfort to that animal. Now Mm -hmm. we're talking about dogs here. So just as a side note, social support is not necessarily helpful to animals that are not social species, but we're talking about social species here. So yeah. um, Yeah. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions around that social support piece. mm -hmm. Um, You know, if you comfort your dog during a thunderstorm, then you're reinforcing their fear, which You know, of course, that's not where we're coming from, but I think it's really um, nice in a lot of the conversations that are happening surrounding resilience that that's a big piece of it. Um, Mm -hmm. So I really, I really appreciate you mentioning that. Yeah, I think I also think exercise and enrichment are just so overlooked as a component of helping the dog. Like people are like, oh, yeah, I took my dog out for a half hour walk up the road and back that's enough. Or, you know, I threw the ball around in the backyard, that's enough enrichment. And I I just don't think people really, really appreciate how much it can play a a good positive role for the dog. It's really exercise in particular, although I think, well, enrichment is really important too. I just, I think the thing about exercise is we maybe have a little bit more research on that in sort of a so-called natural environment, because you can, you know, you can take a person, a human being that hasn't been exercising a lot and feels really depressed or anxious and have them exercise. Most people are getting probably enough enrichment. I mean, we can make arguments, right. About like, right. Yeah. TV and video <laughs> games. <laughs> that, compared to a typical dog, right. People are getting way more enrichment. Mm -hmm. But if Mm -hmm. you look at the exercise research in human beings, uh, exercise in many cases is as effective as an antidepressant medication at reversing depression, which is not to say, you know, that's going to be that, that's true for everyone. And you have to get the person who feels depressed to exercise in the first place, which is not, I can say this because I... (laughs) I've had depression, major depression for like 20 years. Um, So it's, you know, again, it's complicated, but there are a lot of benefits. The research on enrichment is a little bit trickier because they're generally taking rats who are living in very impoverished environments to begin with Mm. and adding like toys and tunnels and other rats. Right. So it has a huge benefit, but... Well, I don't, I don't want to say, but it has a huge benefit. I just think that the research on exercise is a little bit more robust yeah. because we have it on humans as well. Um, mm-hmm. We, and the reason I'm not talking about dog specific stuff is because we have very little dog specific research. We do have a few studies on enrichment in dogs that do show benefits, particularly to like cognition. Do you think um, that, that stuff because okay so one of the parts um that i'm thinking of as as far as how we can support our dogs that i think you mentioned everything that i was kind of thinking of when i was thinking of re- building resilience except for um kind of helping them complete the stress cycle so and i know exercise can play a part of that i think in the human research they talk about. I don't know if there's, is there research about helping dogs complete the stress cycle, like for those dogs that are just like kind of dysregulated and and kind of having trouble coming down from that? Yeah. So that (laughs) terminology, (laughs) I have not seen that terminology in the research and it's possible that it's out there and I'm just not reading those papers. So I think what they're talk I think what they're talking about is figuring out how to 
kick animals out of that dysregulated state. Kind of, um, my understanding is like helping them return to their baseline. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So it could be more of a dysregulation type of like uh, toxic stress, or maybe also just dogs that, you know, have trouble, you know, how some dogs recover really quickly from stressful things, um, even if it's um, tolerable stress. Um, and, but they just stay in it longer. Um, so that's my impression of what the definition of, is, but I, okay. but that's. So, yeah, just, so I would say recovery is the language I would, which is not to say I'm okay. right and the other one's wrong. It's just, that's the language that I use no, no, and that's yeah, what they would talk about um, uh-huh. in the research that I've read. So, yeah, so this is about how long does it take for the animal to recover mm-hmm. if they're already dysregulated. If the dog is already in an unhealthy state of chronic stress or toxic stress, this becomes very complicated. And in many cases, we don't know how, I mean, that's the whole problem, right? Is once Mm -hmm. they sort of go off the rails, it's really very poorly understood how we can get back on. Uh, and there are things that help. There's medication uh, in humans, meditation, and then all those other things I just listed, right? Those can all help. Right. But if we're talking about in the moment, trying to sort of decompress or bring that stress level down, uh, still control and predictability are huge. Mm-hmm. I mean, those five things are still really big. And then, um, I guess what I would add on to that is relaxation. So this is really what we're talking about is trying to activate and engage the parasympathetic nervous system, which Mm -hmm. so when stress activates it, in addition to stress hormones being released, the sympathetic nervous system activates. That's that release of adrenaline and noradrenaline, which is now called epinephrine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I know, norepinephrine I know. just like, to make things confusing. Enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so the parasympathetic nervous system brings it back down again. And someone at some point, I wish I could remember who it was. I think it was maybe a professor of mine, but someone said, if you can't remember the difference between the two, the parasympathetic nervous system is like the parachute that brings yes. you slowly back down to the ground. So that I, I think some of what they're talking about with completing the stress cycle is trying to engage that parasympathetic nervous system. So that would be activities mm-hmm. like take a breath, like teaching the dog to take a breath. Breathing. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. I think sniffing sort of does that a lot because it's sort of engaging them in something that's a little bit relaxing. Uh, relaxation protocols I really, really like, although mm-hmm. I would not start by teaching them when the dog is in a high state of stress, <laughs> start when they're relaxed. Um, right. People talk about massage. So there's a lot of different ways that we can do that. And the, I, I think the best approach is to look at trying to target a lot of those different things at once, because I, again, unless the dog is not really all that stressed to begin with, which a hundred percent, we should still be doing this so that we can prevent right. these problems from developing. But in dogs that are already in really high states of stress, toxic stress, it we're probably going to have to do multiple things. Like you're not going to be able to do one thing and have it like, oh, yay, like right. everything's fine now, right? You're going to have to target several different aspects and in many cases use medication as well. Mm-hmm. How much yeah. are we fighting genetics in this? I mean, unfortunately, we do know there's, you know, there's dogs that are genetically hardwired to be anxious. Um, so how hard is it to, to you know, that's a lot harder, I would assume. With, is that the case? Or It's all, all behaviour is a combination of genetics and experience. So we're always talking about 
There's that always word again, but we're always talking. I will use it this time. We're always talking about an interaction between genes and environment. And again, it's extremely complicated, but in the real world, we will never, like you can run studies in a specific population and you can say in this particular population, you know, genetics accounted for 12% of the variability in this behavior. But in terms of how much it's actually impacting the behavior in this individual dog, we really have no way of judging that. And so what I tell people is there's probably some window of, you know, some range of behavioral expression that this particular dog can have. We don't know what the window is, unfortunately, and so we, t- until we start working with them and then we can move, you know, we can kind of shrink that window in one direction or another and we get as far as we get. So what I would tell clients and now I tell my students is I would just keep working at it because you can't, you can never know for this dog how much of a genetic influence there is um, versus not. And when I say keep working at it, I mean, assuming we're seeing progress, right? Uh, So once you've made progress in my experience, unless it's not steady, you know, if you have a dog that's like really makes a little progress and then backslides a lot and makes a little progress backslides, that's different. But once you're making sort of relatively steady progress, you've seen a lot of change. If you keep working, most of the cases that I have seen, the animal continues to improve. It might be a little bit, but if you take a little bit and you do that over the course of years, you can see really dramatic changes. I talk about Mm -hmm. my dog, Finn, who's right here. (laughs) And... um. I used to talk about, you know, how he's like a chaos demon and he has, he's like, has all these issues and struggles and he's six now. And I'm like, I don't know if I can still talk about him like this <laughs> because he's really, you know, it's taken a lot of time, a lot of training, a lot of medication, but uh, I shouldn't say a lot of medication, but medication. <laughs> and he's pretty easy to manage at this point. So you know, you keep working at it and you were very often continue to see progress. It does slow down for sure, but I think it's worth it. To oh, keep totally. Going. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I know that didn't exactly directly answer your question no, does, about yeah. genetics, but we don't have yeah. great answers to that question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And even if we did have the research, we, like that said, it's, this exact percentage, we still wouldn't know what the window looked like for that particular dog. Right. Like, so, so I I really like the idea of, you know, keep on working on it. And if you come to a plateau and there's nothing to add to the behavior modification protocol that could help bump you over the plateau, maybe that's the edge of that window. But until we you know, kind of, and, you know, with separation anxiety, as you well know, is all about those tiny steps, right? We're not taking leaps and bounds ever. (laughs) We're just doing those tiny steps. So, um, so I think a lot of our listeners will be able to totally relate to that comment that you made. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it's good to know, you know, if they think that they're stuck and there's no, you know, they can still make progress. It's just doing the work, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if they're really stuck, you know, obviously going and talking to their behavior consultant, but you know, that's the time to look at, do we need to add something in? Do we need to change something? Do we need to add or change medication, add or change the, you know, behavior modification plan? Um, so it's, it's certainly not to say like, keep doing what's not working. Right. (laughs) But if you feel like it's working, keep doing those things. And even if you feel like you've, you know, it was working, it was working, it was working. And now you kind of hit a wall, but you're still in a much better place where you were. If you keep doing it 
I still often see that you do make progress. And remember, I'm not talking specifically about separation anxiety because I right. didn't, I did very little work with that. Uh, but the other behavior issues that I work with, which is basically everything else, that is what we would typically see. Mm. And plateaus uh, can be quite normal. Just, yeah. Just yeah, to yeah they are normal. Yeah. I guess it's disheartening for people because they get to this plateau and they're like, well, we're not getting anywhere. What is the point of all this? So that makes yeah. it hard. But yeah. It is. Yeah, it is really hard to do it in the day to day. One of my friends, and I wish I could remember which one, but one of my friends who's a CSAT said that, in her opinion, most of the separation anxiety cases that are not resolved are not resolved because the client stops too soon. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that when they stick it through, yeah. you usually see progress, which is not, again, not every, not true for mm-hmm. every case. Yeah. I um, would say that that was true. Like that, that most people who do stick with training um, will see, you know, improvements. I, I mean, they might right. not get to their, if they had an eight hour goal, that might not be within the, the realm of possibility, but you know, a right. good four hours or whatever, if they keep on yeah. chipping away at it, the, the cases that I think are the hardest in my experience to resolve are the ones who, um, have kind of, um, you know, the dog that has generalized anxiety or yeah. as well as separation anxiety. And also they have all these health problems. And by the way, you know, they, they care, you know, they have a bunch of GI problems and this and that, like, and it's just so many pieces, um, that, you know, kind of managing what's the health issues and, and getting the, mm-hmm. I'm assuming dysregulated stress cycle under control. Most likely. Um, yeah. It is, is kind of tricky sometimes. Um, and those are the cases that a, a lot of times I see, um, not that they're not resolvable, but they're more, uh, much more difficult um, cases. Yeah. And I would agree with that. And other types of behavior issues as well as it's when you have multiple, multiple things going on and there can be, you know, different reasons for that. But certainly one cause of that is that the animal has experienced toxic stress at some point, um, often mm-hmm. during development. And now you're seeing the impacts of that toxic stress. Mm. Right, right. So I did have a question and I don't know if there's an available answer, but my question is this, um, and, I, and I, it just brought, uh, you brought it up when you said um, when it happens during development, and then we see those changes in the brain. Um, and, and so do those then change, can they change back? Like if we're saying like the prefrontal cortex will maybe shrink or maybe they're, or, you know what I mean? Like, so I'm, I'm just like, is that recoverable or is that something that happens? And then you're just dealing with that for the rest of the dog's life. So I have three answers to that question. Uh-huh. So the first answer is you may be able to recover it if you start very, very, very young. Okay. So we do have some evidence that when you're starting with really young animals and you just like, they'll do maternal stress or something where they'll like separate them from their moms. And then, um, and then they provide them with lots and lots of enrichment, and they can often see that those impacts of maternal s- separation will go away. But that has to be pretty young. Pr- I would, I would. This is in rats because we don't have this kind of research in dogs. It probably wouldn't be approved, by the way, um, for ethical reasons. But which, I mean, we can argue whether it's ethical to do it in rodents, but they do. I know. Um, I was going to say, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it probably would not be approved in dogs, though. To like take them away from mom and then like see how messed up they are. So, Mm -hmm. um, but in rodents, if they stress them young and then do some kind of intervention, you can reverse things. But I think those are still, I I think that's still pre adolescence. So like juvenile rats. Mm -hmm. So that's one answer that you may be able to recover if you start very early. 
The second answer is that in healthy adults, so what I mean is adults that are not in dysregulated stress, they do seem to recover from chronic stress. So we actually have research that shows that like humans that are under stress, you can see in brain imaging that their hippocampus shrinks. Mm -hmm. But then once that stress ends, it will often recover in some nice. And you also like see recoveries. That. Yeah. yeah. Um, like you can that. also see like you'll see a memory deficit and then that comes back again. So in healthy humans, sorry, in healthy adults, including healthy humans, but also most <laughs> likely healthy dogs, uh, you can see that recovery. If they've experienced toxic stress, though, you, you may not necessarily get that. It could just create this further spiral. So the third answer, which is probably the most common answer, unfortunately, is that you can't really, you can't go back. You can't go back and fix it. What you might be able to do is compensate for it. And I have this okay. lovely graphic that I don't have available for you guys now, but um, it it's sort of like maybe now we have to build this different new pathway that was not how it would have originally gone. And now it takes maybe a more convoluted, possibly more complicated pathway, but we might still be able to get them to where we want them to be or to an approximate approximation of that place. But you can't okay. go back and like start over again. Okay. So it's kind of like when you get an injury, yeah. And you're compensating um, using different muscles or different way of walking or whatever. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a great analogy. I recently had a knee injury and I went to my sports medicine doctor who's amazing. And he was looking at me and he said, did you used to have an injury on this? Or did you, have you ever injured your knees before? And I said, Yes, but it was so long ago. <laughs> I don't remember anymore which one it was. And he's like, well, I'll figure it out. And so he looks at my knees and he's like, it was this one, wasn't it? And then he like pushes on this one part of my knee. I'm like, yeah, that hurts. He's like, yeah, that's your old injury. <laughs> so I think because I thought I didn't know, you know, mm -hmm. that there was still anything there, but he was able to pick on it up on it quite quickly and he said, this is why you're having problems now. It's not the same injury, but it's the same knee. So oh, that's a great yeah. analogy is mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, you, you just can't go back and rebuild that from scratch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think I like your middle answer the best, <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> but you know, as as I do think it's encouraging though, even in the last answer, that you know, there is a possibility to um, you know, come up with another way to right. to achieve what you need to achieve or to overcome that or to become regulated or whatever, um, right. however you want to state that. Um, okay. Okay. Um, Ness, did you have any additional questions? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, I, I am interested. I, I know we were talking about at the beginning of, of this um, interview or before the interview, we were talking about the, um, the references in your book going on for 40 pages and how, <laughs> yes. how Stacey was saying, well, your, your, the way you provide the information is a lot more palatable, for want of a better word. I, I'm, I'm actually um, kudos to you for wading through 40 pages worth of references. And if they're that dry, um, hopefully it wasn't too bad. <laughs> well, I don't find them dry. Usually. No. So it depends on the writer. <laughs> Some of the authors are quite bad, but uh, there are scientists that write well. But it's if you're not like a super hardcore science geek, and especially if you haven't had that training, they're hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, even for me, sometimes that are hard to get to, but yeah, they're. Yeah. 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 Well, and the other thing I really like uh, about the book, and I promise I like, I'm not going to stand on a thing, but um, the, you have an appendix that, that kind of oh, talks yes. about um, how you can better digest science oh, um, right. and, yeah. and the things to look for to, to determine if a study is a good study, you know, if it's well-constructed, 
and, and all of that. So I thought that section was um, really awesome as well. In addition to that, Dr. Spalding has a group called Research Bites that meets monthly, monthly still. Yes. Um, to uh, review a paper and um, a scientific research paper and then discuss how to best apply it in the dog training world. Um, so that's awesome. And then you have a bunch of online classes um, and a coaching group as well, right? I do. Yes, actually. So yeah, and the um, the research bites just coincidentally, next month's article happens to be on the impacts of uh, early adversity on Ooh. behavior in dogs. So this is very exciting because it's one of the very first studies that's specifically looking at dogs. There have been a few others, but uh, so that's coming up. And then, yeah, I have an unlocking resilience course, which is, which I took, of- which was great as well. <laughs> yeah. Um. So that's kind of an expansion of the book, I guess I would call it. And then, um, yeah, I do have a coaching group. It's, it's a, it's a practicum, I call it, but it's a six month commitment where we meet once a week to discuss cases. Now I will say again, I know I keep saying this, but I'm not necessarily an expert in separation anxiety. So if someone only does that, probably not the best match, but if you work on other types of behavior cases as well, uh, then certainly that might be something to look into. Yeah, we'll put all your links in the in the show notes anyway. But um, I guess one of the things you're saying is we need more research into dogs as well. Um, yeah, that's yes, and it's happening. It, I'm really excited to report that it is coming fast and furious now to the point where I'm 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 not really like I'm missing a lot of papers. But I would so much rather have that situation (laughs) than where we were at before. So it's very exciting right right now to be in the field. If you had a, a, if you had a magic wand and you could say, "This is what I want research done on," like this is the one I want the most, what would it be? Increasing resilience in dogs. And why would that be? I mean, that's pretty obvious, but (laughs) because I think. I think like stress impacts everything, literally. And so, and genetics does too, right? But that's a little harder to manipulate. So I think if if we can teach our animals how to cope with hard things, how to do hard things, then to me, that's like the whole, that's the whole mm-hmm. picture, right? Like, isn't that the holy grail? And I, and the other really cool thing about that is that in learning about stress and resilience, it brings in all of these other aspects of behavior. So like one thing we didn't really talk about tonight was relationship. Mm. It looks like relationship is huge in terms of impacting how animals cope with their lives. And I mean, relationship between them and people, although certainly other Mm -hmm. dogs could be important too, but so it's it's very, I feel like looking at resilience sort of requires you to be very comprehensive and holistic and you can't just focus on one thing because then you're not going to get that balance. So that's the other reason is I think that by focusing on resilience, we will by default also be learning about a lot of other aspects of dog behavior. Mm, cool. Well, hopefully some people will do your... We'll get, make sure that link to your courses is in the show notes, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah thank yeah. you. Fabulous. So just um, tell for the people who are driving and listening, um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that's what I, I, I'm frequently driving or yes, me too. mowing the lawn or <laughs> like whatever. So I'm not necessarily, but tell them what your um, website is, just if they want to put a pin in their mind to, to go sure. visit it. Yeah, it's www.sciencemattersllc.com. Fabulous. That's the business name is Science Matters Academy. Yes. Yeah. And it's awesome. Everything that I have um, been to is is really well done and um, very researchy, which I love. 
so. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Sure, thank you for having me. I loved it. I'm yeah. sure we could have yeah. talked for another hour, but... Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to keep my eye on the time so we wouldn't keep you forever. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it's been great, really interesting. Great, I love talking about it, so... Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of Tales from the Doghouse. Um, I am Stacy Bell with Focus Fun. You can find me at focusfun.net. Yeah, and I'm Ness Jones from um, Separation Anxiety and Dogs Decoded, and I am on nessjones.com. Thank you for listening, and thank you, Christy. Oh, Dr. Sporting again. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Yeah.